Hi class, this is a video record of uh, the course Sutra Studies and uh, this is the lecture for week three. Well then let me turn on the slide. Okay, so we still study Tipitaka and uh, um, you will, uh, we will focus on Sutanta Pitaka for stra uh, Sutra studies. And uh, two weeks ago, we, you studied Diga Nikaya and last week Majima Nikaya in the continuation of studying uh, Sutta Pitaka. Uh, today you will study uh, Samyutta Nikaya. One of Sutta Pitaka, known as Samyutta Nikaya, has 7,762 suttas of varied length, uh, generally short, but some sutta has a uh, uh, middle length, like Majjhima Nikaya. But there is no long length of a sutra in Samyutta Nikaya. Samyutta Nikaya is grouped in a special order in accordance to a subject matter, you know, such as related subjects grouped together. And the Samyutta Nikaya is arranged into five major divisions. The first one is Sagata Bhaga, second, Nidana Bhaga, third, Kanda Bhaga, fourth, Salayatana Bhaga, the last one is Maha Bhaga. Each major bhaga is divided into 56 groups known as samyutta. So samyutta means related subject grouped together. The samyutta are named after the subject they deal with, for example, Kosala samyutta, there is one kind of samyutta, is a group of discourses concerning the dialogue between the Buddha and the king of Pasenadi. The king Pasenadi of Kosala. Uh, the uh, Pasenadi is the name of a king and then the, uh, his nation uh, is called Kosala. And also you might remember the son of King Pasenadi was Jetta. Uh, last week when you studied Jetta grow, Jetta monastery, Jetta Group Monastery, Jetavana Monastery. That was originally belonged to the son of the king, uh, Pasenadi of Kosala. And then, anyway, I just uh, remind you about uh, of the name of King Pasenadi. And uh, uh, another Samuta named Devata Sutta, uh, Devata Samuta deals with the dialogue between Diva, like Brahma and Indriya, with the Buddha or a dialogue between Diva and the Bhikkhus. Okay, so each Samyutta is further divided into sections or chapters which are made up of individual sutra. So this is the uh, kinds of uh, example how the sutra um, organized uh, in a pattern. So. Let's see, the, this is the last Vaga, the Mahavaga, the fifth Vaga division. And each Vaga is further divided into chapter. You can see here chapter, chapter, and one we can call that section. And then each chapter is made up of individual uh, sutra. Okay, so in this chapter, it has uh, several sutras. And there are several stress belong to this chapter, and then several chapters belong to Mahabhaga, and Mahabhaga is one of division, making up of Samyutta Nikaya. And then this sutra named uh, Dhamma Chakka Pavatana Sutta, uh, this sutra is very famous, and then first sutra, uh, which in the second section of Saka Samuta, which comes 
under the Mahabhaga division of Samhita Nikaya. So we will, uh, so you have, we have a five major divisions. So I'm going to introduce some suttas which belong to each bhaga. And then we will figure out what kind of a doctrine or a Buddha's teaching can, um, can be expound uh, throughout each bhaga. First, Sagata Bhaga. The major division of Sagata Bhaga, Samyutta, contains 11 Samyuttas with this course grouped according to characters appearing in them. So what kind of a character? They were the king of Diva, or just the Divas, the Brahma, Mara, king of Kosala, Pigus, and Pibunis. The name of Bhaga, such as a Sagata Bhaga, like a Bhaga, uh, is derived from the fact that various personalities appearing in the Sutra conducted their dialogues who were interviews with the Buddha mostly in the form of a verse. In the form of a verse. Okay, let me write down some words. And then the, in the form of a verse. The dialogue and dialogues and interviews with the Buddha is written mostly in verse. And then the first chapter named uh, Divata Samyutta, and then uh, the Buddha teaches in this Samyutta, all beings are entangled in the mesh, mesh of attachment brought about by six internal sense bases and six external sense object. So six kinds of internal sense bases is more like eye, ear, nose, and tongue, and your body. And then six external sense objects can be visual form and you know, the uh, visual form or you know, uh, hearing olfactory form or you know, auditory form, those kinds of external stimuli is called um, six external sense object. Okay? And then they interact with each other. The way to escape from this entanglement is to become established in Shila morality, to develop concentration meditation, Samatha, and insight meditation, Pipasana. Samatha meditation, concentration meditation, and insight meditation, vipassana. So, because of the interaction between six external, six internal sense base and read six external sense objects, humans have more defilement. How can you purify this defilement, this entanglement? How you help human can escape from this entanglement? We need to cultivate sila, concentration meditation, called samatha, inside the meditation, vipassana. And one of the sutra uh, in um, Sagata Bhaga is called uh, Rohita Sutra. Rohita Sutra. Okay. In uh, Rohita Sutra, uh, I'm sorry, Rohitasa Sutra, Rohitasa Sutra. Rohitasa Sutra, Rohitasa Diva, came to the Buddha with this problem. So Rohitasa Diva has a question to the Buddha. Rohitasa Diva tells the Buddha that he was a, a hermit endowed with supernormal psychic power in the former life. And his supernormal psychic power enabled him to traverse throughout the universe with immense speed. 
Why he traveled? He had traveled with that speed for over 100 years to reach the end of the world, but he could not succeed. It's like someone is curious of, of what is there over the horizon, okay? And then just walk toward the horizon, you know, to reach over the horizon. It's like that. So this Rohita Sadiva travel throughout the world with immense high speed to reach the end of the world, but he could not succeed. He was to know whether it would be possible to reach the end of the world where there is no birth nor death by traveling there. So he wanna find them. There might be some place where there's no birth, no death. Maybe that might be the end of the world. So he traveled, but he could not find the world. So the Buddha says, the Buddha does not declare that there is a world's end where there is no birth, no death to reach by traveling there. But the Buddha, this does not mean that there is an ending of suffering without reaching Nirvana. You might not find some world where there's no birth, no death by traveling there. That does not mean there is no ending of suffering without reaching Nirvana. It is, it is in understanding of oneself with its perception and its mind that the Buddha described the world, the origin of the world, the cessation of the world, and the way leading to the cessation of the world. In other words, the suffering, origin of suffering, cessation of suffering, the way leading to the cessation of suffering can take place through your mind, your perception, not just physically traveling to somewhere else. And the Buddha's way leading to the cessation of the world is the noble path of eight constituents. So it is more like a mind issue rather than physically you can travel throughout you know, traveling in universe. You cannot find some place where there's no birth, there's no death. Another, another sutta named uh, Dutya Aputaka Sutta. Okay, chapter three uh, under the Sagata Vaga. And then there's some um, story. Uh, the Buddha uh, tells some story to the king of uh, Pasenadi. And the background of this sutra is um, the king Pasenadi has taken over an immense wealth. So, the King Pasinadi can get you know, huge wealth, immense wealth. And then this wealth belonged to a multimillionaire who had died recently at that time. So the King Pasinadi has a king, his kingdom, one of, he has one multimillionaire, and then he died. Once he died, his belongings, his this multimillionaire's wealth, or you know, uh, taken over uh, to King Pasenadi. The king once received this immense wealth, then the king reported to the Buddha that the dead multimillionaire actually was a great miser. This multimillionaire was resentful the luxury of a comfortable living. This multimillionaire wear very uh, shabby clothes, 
and you know and eating poor coarse food and travel about uh, travel by the old carriage so at the time there's no car so they uh, when they travel they uh, you know carry on carries they use a carriage but this carriage is was old and roofless there's no roof and so the king uh, of Pasena the curious about just wonder about why this multimillionaire did not use his money for a comfortable life and just reported this to the Buddha and the Buddha told the king the millionaire's past existence you know to expound the reason why the dead millionaire has a poor life in one of the millionaire's past existence he met a Pacheka Buddha Pacheka Buddha oh there's no Pacheka Buddha here Pacheka Buddha is you can write down here Pacheka Pacheka Buddha is referred to as a secondary Buddha. The main difference between Pacheka Buddha and Bu the Buddha is uh, Pacheka Buddha reach perfect enlightenment. Pacheka Buddha attain perfect enlightenment, but Pacheka Buddha does not preach it to a uh, Piku, Piguni, or lay followers. So Pacheka Buddha does not speak out. Uh, Pachika Buddha reach the perfect enlightenment. Maybe one day, you know, the Pachika Buddha passed by and then you know, passed by for one, arms round. So though uh, this millionaire uh, had a chance to meet Pachika Buddha, and then at that time Pachika Buddha asked uh, whether um, and then, uh, I'm sorry, the millionaire asked to Pachika Buddha whether uh, he had given, the Pach Pachika Buddha had, give, had been given any alms food by his family. In other words, you know, the uh, millionaire uh, suggests his family to provide the food to the Pachika Buddha. And uh, uh, so the millionaire gave a commission to his family to offer food to the Pachika Buddha, and he went outside to uh, have another uh, some uh, business. On his way back to home, the millionaire met the Pachika Buddha, and the millionaire looked into the Pachika Buddha's bowl. And upon seeing the delicious food in the bowl of Pacheka Buddha, suddenly some kind of unwholesome thought arose in his mind in a way that, well, it would have been more profitable to feed his servant with such delicious food than to give it away to a Pacheka Buddha. So this multimillionaire think that well, you know, if I had given this delicious food to my servant rather than to Pacheka Buddha, then I might be more, you know, profitable to his life. So that kinds of thought arise or arose. Anyway, because his good deed of allowing his family to make the offering to a Pachika Buddha, he became reborn in the Diva world seven times and became a millionaire seven times in the human world. It's not bad, right? But as a result of ill thought, as a result of unwholesome thought, he had entertained in that previous existence, he never had a luxurious life. 
enjoying fine clothes, good food, and riding in comfortable carriages. So, so it's just kind of a subtle, you know, even though this person has you know, enough uh, money, his mind does not work out to manage comfortable life according to the unwholesome thought arising in his past life. The millionaire has now exhausted the good as well as the bad effect of his thought and actions uh, with regard to the offering of food to the Pachika Buddha. Okay. But uh, unfortunately, he has to face the consequences of more serious evil deed uh, uh, he did in the past life. So he did another evil deed, such as causing the death of his own nephew in a past existence. So he has another uh, level of a bad uh, deed he did. So uh, overall, the Buddha tells the king that the millionaire is uh, therefore reborn after his death in the human world in a state of most in intense suffering world. Okay. So how important we have what kind of thought moment by moment. Okay. That thought really influence uh, some uh, next round of existence. Okay, the second vaga, second division is called a Nidana Vaga. The um, second major division, and it contains 10 Samyutta. And it deals with the principles of conditionality and interdependence. Also, this Vaga explains in detail formula called Patika Samupada and dependent origination. Let's look at a couple of sutra belong to Nidana Bhaga. In chapter two, and then this is code number uh, 63, um, there is a, a sutra named um, Putama Supama Sutra. It's another word, a son's flesh, son's body. And then in this sutra, the Buddha asks about uh, there are four kinds of uh, nutriment for the maintain, maintenance of a being. What are those four? So one is food. Second, contact. Third, mental volition, free will. Last one, consciousness. So these four factors required to maintain human life, human being. Okay. So the food, this sutra starts with the factor, the first factor of uh, edible food. And then uh, this sutra, um, Putama Supama Sutra, was preached to young pigus recently uh, admitted into the order. So uh, once they ordained, they had to go uh, arms round. So in other words, they have to receive some food provided by lay people. And some people might not like some food uh, given by lay people. Okay? And then the Buddha emphasized that young people should take meals neither with overindulged nor reluctant from arms ball. In other words, whatever kinds of food you receive, just take that in order to maintain your life, not for enjoying the taste of food or indulge it with a certain favorable food or even not reluctant from dislike food. So um, the Buddha provide a parable to young beavers. And then this parable is like a, a man and his wife set out on a very long journey through a desert. At the time, their beloved sons was accompanied with them. 
So a man, his wife, and their beloved son all together uh, took journey uh, through the desert. Halfway on their journey through a desert, they ran out of food. They were almost starved to death. Then a man and his wife decide, well, uh, it might be better idea to kill one out of three, you know, to make the rest survive in this journey. So a man and his wife killed their beloved son and crossed the rest of the desert by eating their son's flesh. When they eat their son's flesh, it was not enjoyable. They almost cry. And they call their son's name. And they ate their son's flesh, neither enjoyment nor relish, but only to sustain themselves for the rest of the journey. So you might wonder about how come, how come parents kill their children, their child, you know, to have their food. So don't focus on that anger when you read this sutra. That is the main message the Buddha want to deliver to the monastic. The main point is why you need to take food, how, in what kind of attitude you need to have when you have a meal which you dislike. Okay? So think about when these parents kill their beloved child and then eat the beloved child flesh. At the time, do the parents feel happy by having that uh, food? No, right? But in order to maintain their life, they have to eat, like that kind of attitude. So don't be indulged with a certain kind of food. Don't be reluctant to a certain kind of food. Only think that, only focus that I have to eat this food in order to sustain human life physically. Okay, so uh, of course, this, this course uh, was not preached to lay people. It's, uh, mainly focused on monastics. So they understand that, they fully understand that, you know, the kinds of, uh, uh, it's kind of a fiction, it's a parable. So why uh, the parents kill the son, their son, that is not the main, you know, why the parents murder their son, that is not the main point, but when these parents need to eat this kind of a, a lawful, this in some sense dislike eat their sons of flesh, but only for maintaining their life, they do this way. So when pigs went outside, do arms round, and then when they receive a really dislike food, that is better than you know eating flesh, killing killed by their parents. Right? So it's kind of uh, uh, giving some lesson, giving the lesson. And so one, when one understands the real nature of nutriment on which life depends, one understands the craving responsible for all the suffering. Okay, so if you want to eat some your favorable food, that is based on craving. Okay, so just to take the food to maintain your physical condition, not for over energies, not for relish. Therefore, the way, thereby, the way is open to the supreme liberation once you, uh, once you uh, understand the uh, craving. Other parables are given by the Buddha for the understanding of the remaining three uh, nutrients such as uh, volition, free will, uh, consciousness, uh, vijnana, um, and uh, contact. Okay. 
another um, sutra named uh, Susima Parivajaka Sutra, Susima Sutra. Okay. And this sutra um, uh, is a Susima is a wandering ascetic. Then this wandering ascetic join to the Buddha's order, join to the Sangha. Okay. And wandering uh, ascetic uh, Susima decide to join to the Sangha because Venerable Ananda introduced Susima for a holy life. So uh, Susima decided to become a member of Sangha, but Susima was highly interested in achieving supernormal powers, such as the divine power of a vision, divine power of a hearing, or knowing other people's mind, rather than he became, he become fully liberated. So wandering ascetic Susima heard from, uh, you know, Venerable Ananda as well as other Buddhist uh, monastics uh, saying that uh, you can reach uh, a holy life, but in the middle of that, you will also attain supernormal powers. But this Susima is more uh, target in achieving supernormal power rather, th rather than being fully liberated. So one rainy day, Susima uh, become very disappointed because he has come into the order just to acquire such supernormal power with which to win fame and gain for himself. In other words, with that supernormal power, he want to be famous and then he want to gain some ability for himself. But when he become a member of a Sangha, that does not work in that the environment of a Sangha. So he asked the Buddha that how the Pigus could claim Arhanship when they do not possess supernormal power. So the Pigus do not focus to attain supernormal power. And then that makes curious the Susima curious about how the people claim Arhanship when they do not possess a supernormal power. The Buddha explained to Susima that the, their liberation is through pure insight knowledge, not associated with jhana accomplishment. So jhana means advanced mental state, accomplished by samatha meditation. When practitioner engage in samatha meditation, this supernormal power naturally followed. But the bhivus, the Buddha's uh, uh, disciples, even though they realize some supernormal power, they do not stick to them. They just keep making an effort to reach higher knowledge, okay? That's why the Buddha explained to Susima that the real re liberation is through pure insight knowledge, which is not associated with jhana accomplishment. The Buddha said through vipassana meditation, only practitioner have seen the real nature of Nama and Rupa, followed by realization of Nirvana. So, once they, so uh, I said Nama and Rupa, you, know, you will study that a little bit later, and then uh, Nama and Rupa, uh, Rupa is referred to as five aggregate, five kanda, and then from, uh, from cultivating, from practicing vipassana meditation, uh, the practitioner can uh, fully understand the new, uh, real nature, 
real nature of uh, existence. And the real nature underlies that uh, this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. Okay. When practitioner realized the real nature of this, this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself, then that is the goal of a Buddhism to reach perfect liberation. When Susima realized Aranshit himself without coming into possession of the supernormal powers, he confessed to the Buddha like this, his original motivation to be involved in Sangha was to pursue for attaining supernormal power. And he confessed, Susima confessed to the Buddha. And then Buddha understand that. And then uh, the Susima begged to be pardoned for such evil intention. But Buddha understand and then the Buddha accept Susima uh, keep uh, staying and being a member of a Sangha. Another chapter, another uh, sutra uh, in Nidana Bhaga is uh, walking back and forth, uh, Chankama Sutta. In Chankama Sutta, um, in this sutta, the Buddha saw uh, several of his disciples uh, walking back and forth at uh, nearby Lazagaha. Okay. And then in other words, uh, he has uh, 10 um, respectful disciples and then each disciples has uh, followers. And then the Buddha saw many of his disciples walking, uh, walking back and forth at the, uh, the Jiyakuta hill nearby Lazagaha. When the Buddha saw uh, many of his disciples walking, and then the Buddha said that oh, those many people under the leadership of the Venerable Sariputta are all wise. They are endowed with much deep knowledge of the Dhamma. Continued, the Buddha continued to say, also those his disciples, those surrounding the Venerable Bokalana, are well accomplished in supernormal powers. And people walking with the Venerable Mahakasapa are stick observers of Dutanga, such as austerity practice. And the bhikkhus led by Venerable Anuruddha are fully endowed with the divine power of vision. The Venerable Puna and his disciples are expert at teaching the Dharma. And Venerable Upali with his followers are expert in Vinaya, rules of discipline and Venerable Ananda. The pigus under Ananda's guidance are noted for their knowledge in many fields. But there are other people, such as Devadatta and his followers. Devadatta is, uh, is kind of uh, uh, the human who provide harm to the Buddha many times. So Devadatta and his followers are distinguished by their evil ways, evil thoughts, and evil desires. So in this way, beings are grouped together in accordance with their natural tendency. So this sutta is point, pointing out the natural law of affinity. Okay, so uh, 
uh, Chankama Sutta, uh, from Chankama Sutta, the Buddha uh, point out that the natural law of affinity. So if you look at some uh, name of venerable, there are seven, uh, seven venerable names appear. They are uh, Buddha's uh, senior disciples. Actually, Buddha has uh, 10 uh, senior disciples and then three are missing in this sutra. They are Subhuti, Venerable Subhuti, and another uh, Venerable is Venerable Katyayana, and uh, another one is Venerable Rahula. Rahula is actually the Buddha's son. So uh, we will get, you, you will, we will study the 10, ten Buddha's uh, disciples maybe in other uh, session, other uh, class, but you will know what is the uh, main part of uh, each venerable is really uh, a special. So specialty of each venerable is a little bit different. In terms of venerable Sariputta is endowed with much deep knowledge of Dhamma. So uh, knowledge of Dhamma. And in case of uh, Venerable Maha Mokalana, uh, well accomplished in supernormal power, psychic power, supernormal power. And Mahakasapa is uh, well known is a uh, practice to Tanga or austerity. Austerity practice. Then Anuruddha. Anuruddha is uh, well uh, endowed with the divine power of vision. Divine power of vision. And Venerable uh, Punya and his disciples are experts at teaching of teaching the Dhamma. And Venerable Upali, uh, expert in Vinaya rules discipline. Then Ananda, Ananda uh, was the cousin, Buddha's cousin, uh, and then know uh, many fields, is kinds of knowledge. In any field. So another sutta uh, belong to Nidana Bhaga is like the moon. Kandupama Sutta, like the moon. When the Buddha expound, uh, when Buddha expound this sutta, he the Buddha gives the example of the moon. The, uh, this sutta is mainly how the people has a relationship with other people. So the people should equally treat everyone, showing favoritism to none. In other words, oh, I like these people, so I'm more kind, or 
I dislike these people. So you should, the pig also shouldn't discriminate lay followers. A pig must deal with the people with the regard and the mindfulness should be ever present in his relations with all classes of people. Okay, so in this, the moon reflect on the water and then I mean, uh, the Buddha used the example of the moon. So I'm going to provide a short video like the moon and then Dalai Lama Holiness also speak about the, um, like the moon from the movie of Kundun and then in this case, it's the meaning of uh, uh, the moon is not exactly the same of uh, the meaning of uh, 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 Pama Sutta, but uh, in case of indirect reflection, indirect reflection, the moon can reflect indirectly throughout everyone. Okay? From this indirect reflection, what we can see, how lay people can see, what does Buddha intend to show indirectly okay so you will watch this video mm, hopefully let's see okay let's see oh no how can i make bigger to others. Beings are released through the teachings of the truth, the final reality. Thank you. 
Okay, um, the um, border inspector asked about, asked to him, are you the Lord Buddha? And then um, the Dalai Lama said, uh, I'm a simple monk, and I'm just a reflection, it's like the moon. So when you see uh, me, I try to be a good person so that you can see yourself. So just as the moon shed is light equally on every object or every person, so uh, a people, um, or even in broad aspect, a people should equally uh, treat everyone, young or old, or of a middle age, showing favoritism to none, uh, no hostility to anyone. So when we equip this kind of wholesome mind, some other person see yourself, and then that person who see you become also see themselves in a good way. Okay, so now let's move to the third division, uh, Kandavaga. And Kandavaga is made up of 13 chapters, and it, it forms an important collection of uh, Doctrinal discussion on topics such as uh, uh, self, non-self, eternity, and annihilation. The main theme of most suttas in this division, Kandavaga, is, as the name implies, Kanda. Kanda means the five aggregates. Uh, five aggregates constitute what is regarded as a human being. And each component of five aggregates is a rupa, physical aggregate, vedana, feeling, sanya, or perception, samkara, mental formation, and vijnana, self awareness. Okay. And these five aggregates is shown to be a bundle of dukkha, suffering. We need the five aggregates, but depending on how you use these five aggregates, you know, these five aggregates can act as a bundle, suffering. So let's uh, study five aggregates a little bit more. Totality of the five, five kanda, five, five aggregates. 
Five condors compose the living organism and manifest themselves in cognitive process. All physical and mental phenomena of human experience can be manifested through five condors. Rupa is a physical aspect of human body and the rest, Vedana, Sanya, Sankara, Vijnana, these four aggregates, four aggregates imply the mental aspect of being. So this part is a mental aspect. We call that Nama. And here's Rupa. So I already uh, spoke Nama Rupa in the beginning of this uh, lecture. So five aggregates, five khandas can be categorized in the two, such as Nama and Rupa. Okay. So Nama includes Vedana, Sanya, Sankara, Vijnana, because this is a mental phenomena, and then Rupa is more physical uh, aspect. Even though this is a physical aspect, some many Buddhist scholars uh, address that Rupa itself also carries some sensorial um, meaning. That is too much detail in this class, but five aggregates, five kanda can be uh, categorized into two, such as Nama and Rupa. And then Nama and Rupa, you will hear this expression many times when you read Sutta Pitaka. So uh, one of the, uh, I told you that uh, these five aggregates can be the source of a burden, suffering. So there is one sutra, the name burden, the burden sutra. And then Buddha asked about what is the burden? The five aggregates subject to clinging. What is five? The form aggregate subject to clinging. The feeling aggregate subject to clinging. A perception aggregate subject to clinging, mental formation aggregate subject to clinging, and self awareness aggregate subject to clinging. This is called a burden. What is the carrier of the burden? Who carries this burden? The person, the person with a name and clan at the time, you know, what kind of a family, you know in India at the time. So the person with a name and claim, they are carrier of the burden. Okay. And what is the taking up of the burden? Okay. And the it is craving. What is the factor take this burden? And then it is a craving that leads to renew existence, existence it is craving for sensual pleasure, craving for existence, craving for extermination. This is called the taking up of the burden. Okay. So it is this craving that leads to renewed existence, accompanied by delight and lust, seeking delight here and there. Therefore, craving is the main carrier of the burden. Because of a craving, people, human being carry this burden. Then what is the laying down of the burden? It is a remainderless fading away and cessation of that craving, giving up the craving, freedom from craving, no reliance on craving. This is called the laying down of the burden. So, so we need a five kanda, but how you use five kanda is important. Depending on how you use a five kanda, you are free from craving. You are just have entangled with more burden. Okay, 
And then what is main factor to determine you can be liberal or you can be you can be entangled with the burden that is your craving. Craving. Okay. And uh, the other sutta uh, named uh, Kimaka uh, Kimaka Sutta. Kimaka Sutta is also you can find this from Kanda Baba. And then um, this. Uh, Kemaka Sutta record the conversation between uh, Piku Kemaka and a group of Pigus uh, to verify the stage of their uh, mental attainment, their spiritual attainment. When the Pigus ask to uh, Kemaka if the Kemaka sees self or anything pertaining to self in the five aggregates, Kimaka replies, no, I do not see self in any kanda of a five aggregates, any aggregate of a five kanda, same meaning. But when the Pigus suggest that, if so, Kimaka, <clears throat> excuse me, the Pigu Kimaka must be an Arahan, free from defilement. Then Pigo Kimaka rep replies that even though he does not find the self or anything pertaining to self in any of the five khandas, he is not Arahan who is from defilement yet. He still has a vague feeling, I am, although he does not clearly see this is myself with respect to Rupa, Vedana, Sanya, Sankara, Vijnana. So when you have this phenomena such as Rupa, Vedana, Vedana is like feeling, Sanya, Sankara, Vijnana, when you have this kind of experience, each stage, if you do not see, oh, this is my Rupa, if you do not see, this is my Vedana, this is my sanya. If you do not see, this is myself with respect to rupa, vedana, sanya, sankara, vijnana, that means you are fully enlightened. But Pigu Kimaka says that I still have a vague feeling I am, even though I do not clearly see this is I with respect to five kanda. His vague feeling is likened to the smell of a flower. So there is some uh, analogous expression occur. So when you have a smell from the flower, and then where does this smell come from? The smell does not come from the petals. The smell does not come from the pollen. The smell does not come, does not come from pizza, but there is a smell from entire flower. Like that, there is no myself from rupa. There is no, you know, there is no meaning of this is I from Vedana. This is I from Sanya. This is I from Sankara. This is I from Vinaya. Vinaya, uh, I'm sorry, Vinaya. But still, there is some vague feeling such that I am. Then Kimaka then goes on to explain that even if a person retains the feeling I am at the early stage of realization, but as he progresses further and attain to higher stage, his feeling of I am disappear altogether. Just like the smell of soap lingers in a freshly washed cloth and disappears after a time when it is kept in a box. So when you wash your hands with soap, I mean, at the beginning, you, you know, even if you do not fully rinse with water, you can still smell the soap 
But if you continue to rinse with water, the smell of soap disappear. In the same way, if you practice at the beginning, you feel that, oh, this is not myself from your body, Rupa. This is not me from Vedana, your feeling. This is not I from Sanya. This is not myself from Sankara. But still, you still have overall, overall I am, the vague feeling of I am from five khanda at the early stage of realization. Then do not stop that stage. Push, proceed more, make more effort so that eventually that this is I, that defilement will completely fade away. Okay, that kind of information um, expound in uh, Kimaka Sutta. Okay, so five kanda, we need that, but how in qualitatively, not quantitatively, qualitatively, how we operate these five kanda, five kandas is really important thing. Okay, let's move to the next, uh, the fourth vaga, Sal Ayatana Vaga. And then uh, this division is made up of 10 samuta, and it deals mainly with six sense organs or basis of a contact named internal sense basis, and the six corresponding sense objects known as external sense basis. So internal sense basis like ear, eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind. And external sense base is a visible form, sound, odor, taste, tangible things, and mind object. These, there is a contact should be there. The contact should be there between internal sense basis with external sense basis. Then consciousness arises in relation to each pair of these external and internal sense basis. In other words, when I hit visible form, then you will see vision. When hear, when ear hear sound, then you will have auditory activity, something like that. So, but uh, there are expositions on the impermanence nature of these sense bases and how <clears throat> Excuse me, my voice is sometimes, uh, sometimes go and comes back. So there are expositions on the impermanent, impermanent nature of these sense bases, and then how uh, relinquish, how uh, removing, uh, how get rid of attachment to them uh, result in liberation. The sensation arising from coming together of the sense bases and consciousness is known, is shown to be three kinds. So in other words, when I contact visible form, that immediately Vedana feeling arise. So there are three kinds of a feeling. One is pleasant, second one is unpleasant, the third one is neutral, indifferent. That always happen. When your ear hears sound, then you will have one of three feelings, such as pleasant, oh, I like that sound. Unpleasant, I dislike that sound. Indifferent, neutral, well, I neither like nor dislike the sound. Okay. But even though pleasant, unpleasant, indifferent feelings None of them is permanent. Each of these is the cause of a craving, which in turn is the root of all suffering. If you stick to, oh, I like this sound, I'm gonna keep listening to this. If you cannot hear that sound, okay, oh, how can I you know, persist to listen to that sound? That kind of cleaning, 
turning to the root of all suffering. So, uh, how you can control your mind? And then these uh, many sutra involved in Sar Ayatana Bhaga introduce uh, Vipassana meditation. Um, from that practice, some how uh, practitioner illuminating uh, to reach uh, Nirvana, how you control uh, this sensory uh, system, sensory mechanism, so that uh, these six, six sense organs and six sense bases, we need that, but how you can operate these uh, sense organs uh, and sense bases to reach uh, the perfect liberation. And then those things are mainly um, expounded in Sarayatana Bhaga. And uh, if you, uh, one of the sutra belong to Sar Ayatana Bhaga is the, the simile, the simile of six animals, simile of six animals. And then the name of the sutra is uh, Chapana Kopava Sutra. Chapana Kopama Sutra. And then the Buddha preaches that a pigu practicing the holy life must exercise uh, control of his sense faculties. The six sense faculties uh, may be compared to uh, six animals, namely a snake, maybe crocodile, a giant bird, a dog, a jackal, and monkey. Suppose uh, each animal is bound by a rope and the ropes are tied together into a single knot. When they are left in this state, each animal will try to get to its own habitat. The snake to its underground hole, the crocodile to the river, etc. So these six kinds of animals is bound by a rope, by a string. And then this string, this rope, are tied together in one spot, one maybe pillar. Then these six kinds of animals is going to uh, move their own way. So in case of a snake, they want to go down on the ground hole. And crocodile want to go to river. A monkey want to climb the tree. In this way, they will pull and struggle against one another until they become exhausted and drag along by the strongest of them. So at the beginning, they do their own way. They behave their own way and then they, their energy is worn out. And then the last, the strongest one is going to drag the rest of the animals. This, this is a simile, right? So the mind of a bigu with unrestrained sense faculties, if the bigu's mind is not well practiced sense faculties, will be impaired by the sense toward the corresponding sense of that. Okay, so those bigu's mind go here and there, it's like a monkey, right? But suppose that uh, each animal is bound by a separate rope, separate uh, string, which is fastened to a pole firmly planted in the ground. So each animal has a, a separate rope and then each rope is uh, planted in the ground. Each animal will make a great effort to return to its home and becoming exhausted finally. Therefore, they will stand or sit, or some of them might lie down quietly near the post. Similarly, uh, the people practicing contemplation 
of their body, contemplation on Vedana, contemplation on Sanya, contemplation on Sankara, contemplation of uh, Vinana, Vinyana, I'm sorry, Vinyana, I'm a little bit confused to pronounce Vinyana and Vinaya. And Vinyana is consciousness, Vinaya is a uh, discipline. Vinyana uh, is well uh, under control. Okay, so mindfulness of the body serves as the form post to which each of the faculties is tied down. Okay, so um, a strong post or pillar is a designation for mindfulness directed to the body. Therefore, you should train yourself. You will develop and cultivate mindfulness directed to the body, make it our vehicle, make it our basis, stabilize it, exercise ourselves in it, and fully perfect it. This should you train yourself. So when you practice more, your mind more calm down, tranquilize, and then you will not be the slave of six sensory mechanism. The last, the last uh, uh, division is Mahabhaga. It's made up of 12 Samyutta, and the list of uh, which gives a clear indication of the subject dealt with this division. Maha Sam, Maga Samyutta, Bozanga Samyutta, Satipatthana Samyutta, Indriya Samyutta, Samapadana Samyutta, Bala Samyutta, Idipada Samyutta, Anuruddha Samyutta, Jana Samyutta, Anapana Samyutta, Sotapati Samyutta, and Saka Samyutta. The main doctrine which forms the fundamental basis of Buddha's teaching are revealed in these Samyutta. It's very important. Maha means great, right? Great book, Mahabhaga. The division this Mahabhaga covers both the theoretical and practical aspect. So in this Bhaga, the ultimate goal of a holy life, uh, Arahanship, and nirvana, end of suffering, is constantly uh, kept in full, in full view together. So the uh, Mahavaga provides with a detailed description of the way of achieving four noble truths and a noble eightfold path. And in this Bhaga, Mahavaga, uh, you will find the sutra named Dhammachaka Pavatana Sutta, and that is the Buddha's first sermon. Okay, this Dhammachaka Pavatana Sutta appear in the last Samyutta, that is Saka Samyutta. So the uh, that so the first sermon the Buddha gave to outside is uh, this Dhammachaka Pavatthana Sutta. In other words, setting in motion the will of Dharma or putting in motion the will of the teaching. Okay. So uh, the beginning of uh, when Buddha preached this uh, Dhammachaka Pavatthana Sutta, there were five ascetics. And these the first sermon, Buddha's first sermon appears in the, um, okay, so Dhammachaka Pavatana Sutta has been documented in a broad spectrum of a text. Okay? If we include the introductory story, uh, we can uh, provide five parts in this sutra in a sequence. The first part is five ascetics that abandoned the Buddha before, uh, now they start to uh, 
listen to the Buddha's first sermon. The second part, Buddha mentioning middle path. The third part, the noble eightfold path introduced. The fourth part is a four noble truths. And the last part of this Dhamma Chakka Pavatana Sutta is uh, proclaim. The Buddha proclaimed himself as a full, as the person who reached full perfect enlightenment. So first part, the Buddha arrives in the deer park close to uh, Benares. From a distance, the five ascetics see the Buddha arrive and these five ascetics decide that they will not rise up and greet him in respect because the five ascetics remember that the Buddha had broken his fasting. And the Buddha's you know, breaking fasting was a sign to five ascetics that the Buddha returned to worldly abundance. But strangely, as the Buddha comes close to, comes close to uh, comes closer to the five ascetics, these five ascetics cannot contain themselves. They rise and greet the Buddha with the word, be welcome, friend Gotama. Gotama is Buddha's uh, name, personal name. As the Buddha listen about, listen to be welcome, friend Gotama, at the time the Buddha said, do not speak to the Tathagata by name or as a friend. Tathagata is an Arahan and completely enlightened. So Buddha, the Buddha declared himself as the Tathagata in front of five ascetics. The Buddha says to five ascetics, listen, immortality is found. In other words, deathlessness found. I proclaim, I teach the Dhamma. Furthermore, the Buddha explained to the five ascetics that breaking his fasting was not a return to worldly abundance and finally brings five ascetics to the point when they will listen to what the Buddha has to say. In uh, Majmanikai 26, Arya Pariyesana Sutta, it is stated that two or three out of five ascetics at the time would get food for all. In other words, the three or three ascetics need to live for arms round. And then the Buddha continuously told the rest present. So two or three ascetics left for arms round and then the left over two or three ascetics left over keep, uh, kept listening to Buddha's first sermon. And the Buddha declared himself as Tathagata. And then you already uh, heard about Tathagata uh, last lecture. Um, Pali uh, meaning is Tathagata means thus calm and thus gone. The one who comes in uh, our midst bearing the message of deathlessness, immortality, to which he has gone by his own practice of the past. So it's the greatness of Buddhism is the Buddha discover some well systemized way to reach deathlessness. That kind of things cannot be done by any Brahmanism, any Hinduism, any practitioner from Jainism. Okay? And then once the Buddha reach that the deathlessness, now the Buddha provide the path. If you follow this path, any practitioner will eventually reach immortality. And the Buddha systematically provide the path. That is the greatness, okay? And the uh, second part of 
uh, in Dhammachaka Pavatana Sutta is a middle way. So, Pigus, uh, these two extremes should not be followed by one who has gone forth into homelessness. What are two? The pursuit of sensual happiness in sensual pleasure. And the other one is the pursuit of self mortification without veering toward either of these extremes. The Tathagata has awakened to the middle way, which gives rise to vision, which gives rise to knowledge, which leads to peace, to direct knowledge, to enlightenment, to nirvana. In other words, the two extremes are described which must be avoided by all who have abandoned their homes. The practitioner should avoid two extremes. One must not surrender oneself to the pleasure of the object of desire, and also one should not surrender oneself to the mortification of one's own body, which is painful and harmful. By avoiding these two extremes, the Tathagata discovered the middle way, which opens one's eyes, make known and leads to tranquility, leads to insight, leads to enlightenment, eventually to nirvana. So what is the middle way? It is the noble eightfold path. We study noble eightfold path as, uh, last time, so you can briefly review this. And then the last um, path, the eighth pole for uh, eight, uh, the eighth path, right, uh, right concentration is a synonymous of jhana meditation. So the third part of uh, the Machaka Pavatana Sutta is the eightfold noble eightfold path. So I said just before, right samadhi is a synonymous to synonym to jhana meditation. A further task was to intensify and transform the first stage of jhana meditation, which had been revealed by hinting of the middle way. And the, the fourth part of uh, the sutra is Four Noble Truths. The Four Noble Truths resemble uh, the kind of a theoretical frame a Dr. Crude used to uh, explain his therapy. So the four noble truths is first the suffering, there is suffering. Second, the origin of suffering, the cause of suffering. Third, cessation of suffering. The last uh, noble truth is the way leading to the cessation of suffering, okay? So this is similar to a theoretical frame of a doctor. Uh, the doctor can use this kind of a uh, frame, such as there is a, a certain kind of disease. Second truth is the doctor looks for the cause of the illness. And third is the doctor attempts to cure the disease by removing the cause. And the last one, you know, to achieve this, the doctor used a particular therapy. So the Buddha's Four Noble Truths uh, can be uh, analogous to these uh, doctors, medical doctors' uh, treatment to a patient. And then the way uh, to the cessation of suffering is explained by the Eightfold Path, Noble Eightfold Path, and that this means to overcome suffering is mentioned at the last place, at the last place, okay? So the, the last part, though, I said that there are five parts in Dhamma Chakra Papatana Sutta, and the last part of Dhamma Chakra Papatana Sutta is uh, the Buddha's uh, fully enlightenment. And Buddha mentioned that, I did not proclaim to have awakened to the unsurpassed perfect enlightenment in this world. But when my knowledge and vision of these four noble truths, as they really are in their three faces and 12 aspects, 
was thoroughly purified in this way, then I confidently claimed to have awakened to the unsurpassed perfect enlightenment in this world. In this world with Diva, in this world with Mara, in this world with Brahma, in this world with humans. So his enlightenment is not shakeable, it's not temporary one. Unshakeable is the liberation of my mind. This is my last birth. Now there is no more renewed existence. That means the Buddha confidently proclaim his perfect enlightenment and also this life is his last one in last existence. I cannot say only last existence in human realm or maybe the Buddha stays in other realm. I have no idea, but at least this is his, the Buddha's last birth in human world. Maybe whether the Buddha stay in other realm or not, that I have no idea. But in human world, um, this is uh, the Buddha's last birth. Now there is no more renewed existence in human realm. Okay, okay this is all for today's lecture and then you will solve five questions and then you will submit uh, answer um, as answer when you submit this answer uh, i will count that as your attendance the first question who is the buddha's disciple endowed with much deep knowledge of the dharma so you can find the answer uh, when you trace back the slide from this record and feature following is the condition to categorize uh, samyutta nikaya what is the uh, Factor, main factor to put certain sutra in Majjhima Nikaya, put into Diga Nikaya and Samyutta Nikaya. What is the primary uh, key to categorize Samyutta Nikaya? You also find the answer from the beginning of this uh, video. How many sutras are there in Samyutta Nikaya? Also, you can find the answer uh, by listening to this vid uh, video. Which sutra is the first discourse the Buddha gave? The first sermon uh, we studied just before. Okay. And the last question is, please write down a short paragraph, a short essay describing the meaning of a Buddhism to you. Okay. So you can include uh, some idea like this. Uh, when you become to know about Buddhism and how do you get into know of Buddhism? And does the Buddhism impact your life? If so, how do you think the Buddha's teaching is realistic in this modern world or not? If you think yes, then you will a little bit elaborate why you think that. If you think no, then you also can add your opinion. So um, the maximum word is um, no more than 100 words. Okay, so maybe two or three paragraphs. And then you can include not only these uh, ideas, but you can include any opinion regarding the Buddha's teachings. So all these five questions will be the homework. And then same format, you will write down this name. And uh, so this is not correct. This should be, this time is gonna be May 11th. So assignment, this week assignment, solve the five question written in the lecture slides. First, write down your name on the top of the document, then write down the questions and answers in the same document with the 12 font letter size in double space and attach the document to my email address. And then the due of this assignment is May 11th. Okay, this is all for today. And I hope you stay safe and calm and uh, see you next week. Thank you.